cor corruption um, and uh, has been with Crow for um, so long that I think his tenure now has the vote. Um, um, please um, pass my thanks uh, and yours to him, to Teo, Sam, Judith and Anthony, who will be um, uh, running us through this session. Tom, over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, I always enjoy uh, the opportunity to put a suit and a tie on these days, so uh, apologies for that. Um, so yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session, uh, Aligning Your Company Initiatives with Current Human Rights and ESG Demands. Uh, my name is Tom Hollibone. Uh, as Kevin said, I'm the Managing Director for the EMEA region of Kroll's Compliance Risk and Diligence Team. Uh, delighted to be here today. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, an accomplished panel um, who we are looking forward to some lively debate with, uh, and they'll be de detailing some of their learnings uh, and thoughts on this uh, on this topic. Um, before we before we start, before we get into it, um, we will be asking for your participation um, with some polling questions throughout the session, um, and we encourage you all to post questions uh, to the the Q and A functionality um, within Zoom. Um, we have time at the end of the session to, to post these questions to the group um, for their thoughts. Um, so please do, uh, do actively participate with us. So today we'll be discussing some of the considerations and, and practical ways that, that legal and compliance teams can be proactive uh, in, in encouraging your companies to integrate those material ESG risks uh, and opportunities uh, into your, your current and future operations. Um, Although uh, regulators uh, are starting to catch up uh, and they're implementing regulations such as the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation uh, and the EU regulation on the establishment of a framework to facilitate sustainable investments, um, understanding how not only to adhere to these regulations, but also how to weave them into the business processes can be quite complex. Um, and as companies increase their commitment to sustainability uh, and responsible business, uh, In-house legal teams will need to be both reactive and proactive uh, in guiding the business through these requirements and considerations. So let's meet our panelists for today, um, who I will ask um, them each to introduce themselves. Um, so first, uh, Judith, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Judith, we're not getting sound through from you there. Um, does show that you're not on mute, but yeah, no sound coming through. Maybe if we start with Sam and then come back. Yep, thank you. Yeah, I think we're having trouble with uh, with, with Judith there. So um, if we, we hand over to Sam, Sam Lester for us. Sure, can you hear me before I get going? We can, going? we can. Excellent. You, Sam, yeah. Um, yeah, Tom, flying the flag for uh, for the time share. I, I take my house to you. I'm, I'm embracing the post-pandemic polo look uh, for, for the panel, so you have to forgive me in advance. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Sam Lester. Um, I uh, head up legal coverage for uh, TD Securities, which is the broker-dealer for the uh, Toronto Dominion Bank. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Anthony. Hi, sorry, can you hear me okay, Sam and Tom and Judith? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect, thank you. Perfect. So, yeah, so Anthony Kenny from GlaxoSmithKline. I guess I'm um, middling between you and uh, Tom and Sam in terms of kind of more, slightly more ca formal, but still casual. But anyway, um, not suit and tie. Well done. Tom. Um, so yeah, so my role at GSK splits into two halves, basically transactional M&A work and corporate. And then through the corporate, I get to work on things like our sponsorship of COP26 and other um, issues concerning um, ESG. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. And Judith, I'm not too sure if we can hear you yet. We can't hear you, I'm afraid. Judith, just, I don't know if you've seen my message in chat. Next to the microphone symbol, you might get some additional options. Very sorry about this, everyone. As we know, mercy of technology and all. Um, there are some options. Alternatively, you can switch to phone audio and dial in off the phone. If it's, and then we'll be able to get your audio through there and still be able to see you. Um, I can talk you through that on the chat because, yeah, no audio coming through. Sure, is this better now? There we go. There we go. Perfect. Great. 
Good stuff. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Judith Akinosho. I'm currently head of ethics at ByteDance TikTok. Uh, prior to joining um, this company, I was chief compliance officer at S&P Global Platts and market intelligence. And that's where a lot of the ESG experience came through because we essentially at that company started to assess ESG risk many years ago. Uh, prior to that, I spent a lot of time in the extractive industries and started my career um, in legal practice. I'm looking forward to this session. Excellent. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, thank you. Um, great. So um, before we dive in, I think it's pretty good for us to start with a question for the audience. Um, so you should all shortly see the, the poll options on screen, um, if we can get that working. Excellent. Thank you very much. So the question is, uh, what is mainly driving ESG pressure for your organization? Uh, is it regulatory developments, investor expectations, uh, employee pressure, customer activism, or, or no pressure at all? I'm, I'd be surprised if you see too many of those, but uh, uh, for those lucky ones, they, they, may, they may be experiencing that. Uh, we'll give you uh, a little bit of time to, to vote on that. Tom, I can see that, that the panel can play along, which is really good fun. Um, but we might have missed a trick in terms of secret option F, which is, well, mm -hmm. not all of the above, but certainly A to D, because it's uh, it's an interesting question. It is, yeah, there could be many in there. That should have been another option F. <laughs> all of the above. Let's see if we have any uh, if we have any winners, uh, if anything is, is an overriding uh, answer to that. Um, mm. Okay, interesting. So uh, investor expectation is, uh, is, is, is taking the lead there just uh, at a regulatory development. So um, an, an interesting spread, but uh, I, think, I think like our astute panel has, has expected there, it's a, it's a, a, broad, a broad kind of um, broad pressures across the board. Um, you know, for for those legal for the legal teams here. So um, interesting, excellent. Okay, um, well, following the answers that we've uh, we've just seen there, um, uh, do we want to to, to start and uh, maybe Anthony? Do, do you want to start by giving us some uh, some of your thoughts on what the key trends um, that, that you're that you're currently seeing in this in this space and, and how that's affecting you you you, know, you and your business. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll rattle through it quickly, but actually, um, when I started thinking about it, you know, pre preparing for this, there's quite a long list coming, but yes, I'll rattle through it quickly. So increased, I think there's an increased focus on climate change and net zero through the lens of net zero, but but also nature positive. And then certainly in GSK, we're focusing on both. And I think that's probably the right approach. I think there's also an increased focus on reporting. Um, and there's a real shift going from what was voluntary now through to more mandatory reporting. Um, and, and, and I see that through the Modern Slavery Act, but also through things like TSF, TSFD and, and, and so, so many taxonomies around, around climate change that are coming. I think there's also an increased focus on the purpose-led business. Um, and what I'm thinking of there is Section 172 for listed companies and also the rise of the B Corporation. Um, I think it's an important development in this area. I think um, another key trend is the increased litigation. Um, where you know, I break that into two main bits: enforcement of governmental and organisational commitments, but also um, enforce you're trying to get the, the parent companies responsible for, for you know, climate and/or human rights um, issues and subsidiaries. There's an increasing trend we've seen in what, what, 12, 18 months, and I think yeah, as supported by that poll, an increased attack um, by the media and activists on those who are perceived to be greenwash, greenwashing. So those are the kind of trends that I'm seeing. Excellent. I think I think um, there's there's a number of, of topics in there that are that are quite complex. Um, be interesting to delve into a little bit a little bit more. Um, I know that um, that uh, Theo has just joined us, uh, just joined the group here. Um, Theo, I wonder if you might just go to give us a, a quick introduction, and then I might throw the question back over to you in terms of trends that you're seeing, um, you know, from your perspective. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so my name is Theo Jaco. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, lead legal counsel and corporate responsibility expert at Ericsson. Um, so I lead our work on uh, human rights. So in terms of ESG, I, I focus on, on the uh, human rights issues. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, so, yeah, from, from your perspective, you, what, what, what are the current trends that you're seeing yeah, in, in this area? 
Uh, yeah, no, so similarly, I, I think as Anthony raised, uh, of course, the, the uh, push from voluntary principles to mandatory uh, requirements, I, I would say, is, is the key trend right now. Uh, and, and especially maybe, I mean, of course, from my perspective on, on, on human rights, this is a, a big shift uh, from if we look at 10 years ago when the UN guiding principles were adopted to now when we are talking about mandatory human rights, due diligence legislation, not just at the EU level, but also at, at uh, member state level. Uh, so I think that is going to be the, the of course, uh, key differentiator if we look 10 years ahead uh, that, uh, that, that this is now coming. Um, I also also think that uh, beyond kind of the, the discussions of, of new mandatory uh, regulation, there is also an interesting development in case law based on existing legal principles, especially tort law. Uh, a lot of interesting cases uh, coming up, uh, looking at ESG issues, uh, including human rights. Uh, for example, I mean, the Vedanta case in, in UK, uh, interesting, uh, very interesting case on, on uh, uh, establishing control over subsidiaries and what companies actually state in their public documents affects that control. And I think that is, is, is something that a lot of companies maybe are waking up from, that you can't just have these nice statements, uh, but you do really need to uh, put something uh, behind them. Uh, and then just the last trend, I think, from, from my perspective, especially in human rights, uh, which I think is also going to be a key for, for the decade to come, is, is the link between human rights and humanitarian law and the role of business in conflict. Uh, I think more and more companies are are waking up and understanding their role and it's, that it can't just be business as usual in a conflict setting and that there are legal liabilities. Again, a lot of cases now coming up with companies in different countries uh, uh, operating in conflict sensitive uh, situations. So I think that is also a trend that is going to be included in the ESG perspective moving forward. Yeah, there's a a couple of really interesting points in there, in there, dear. And, and one that I wanted just to pull, pull the string a little bit on a little bit further, if you don't mind, around but the comment you made around establishing control over subsidiaries. Um, uh, do, do you have any kind of do you have any thoughts on on you know, how how the participants here um, you know, can go about kind of making that that a bit easier for them in their organisations? Do you have any suggestions on uh, you know, what those challenges are and how maybe to overcome them and, and ways that you have seen that work in the past. I think that's a that's a very interesting interesting topic that I think a lot of people will will be familiar with. Sure. No. So so of course, I mean, this is uh, I think at the key of the discussions currently at the EU level and in, in developing the new mandatory human rights due diligence requirements to to understand kind of how far reaching those requirements will be. Uh, but my recommendation would be to use the existing framework, such as the UN guiding principles, the OECD guidelines, to understand responsibility across the value chain. Because when we talk about human rights risks, it's not necessarily the same kind of legal liability as, for example, control over subsidiaries. But application of those principles, such as the UNGPs, are kind of pushing through uh, in, in, uh, in tort law and other uh, legal frameworks as well. So I think that's what companies need to be prepared to, to be able to demonstrate how you evaluate risk across the value chain. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily legally liable for every type of impact, but you need to be able to demonstrate how you have prioritized risks, even if they're much further down, down upstream or downstream, for example. So use the learnings of this last decade of, 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 of the UN guiding principles. And I think then you're better prepared for the uh, uh, requirements that are coming. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was, um, that was, that was really interesting. Excellent. Um, Sam, I wonder if I might throw over to you, uh, just for your, your initial thoughts and, and you know, uh, elements that you've been maybe challenged with. Uh, I know, you know, obviously you have a slightly different, uh, different perspective, maybe from, from Anthony and, and, and Theo, um, you know, from a financial background. Yeah, yeah, totally. But, you know, it's saying all that, I think it's really interesting to hear Anthony and, and Taylor's feedback. And there's actually, despite the fact that we're sort of sitting in slightly different spaces, there's a lot of common common threads that we're seeing there, right? Mm. Um, and, and I imagine it'll be exact, well, potentially the, the same with Judith. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting for me. I mean, the bank in many respects, you know, we 
much like a lot of uh, sort of my, my esteemed panelists, we have sort of this public role, which is um, which is really interesting. And in many respects, you know, particularly within the broker dealer, we we are acting as facilitator, right? In terms of um, you know our clients um, sort of uh, uh, executing on on their strategic aims. So you know we have to think about. Um, uh, ourselves from the position of the bank, but we also have to think about our clients and their their needs and wants, and also you know uh, uh, wider society. I think it's you know uh, we interesting to me in terms of I bring it back to where does this lead me as a legal counsel within the bank as a you know I'd like to think of myself as a semi value add, and and actually I think. ESG and you know where we're getting to now in terms of the conversation is really where we as um, strategic advisors can really start to flex our muscles um, and add uh, that real value to the conversation and you know that's not just sort of big picture stuff but that's really sort of utilizing all of the apparatus at our disposal to make sure that um, decisions that are being made are made with rigor. I think the big issue that I'm seeing now and I'm sort of you know, following on from, from what Anthony said, I couldn't agree more. I think what's interesting is that, you know, I think if last year or, or a few years before was when ESG was on the sort of horizon and, and sort of the, you know, the buzz acronym to talk about, if, if you know, the pandemic certainly is sort of, you know, uh, where ESG firmly landed on the map. And it's not um, even a case now that you should be interested in ESG or finding out what ESG is. It's you must be interested, certainly from the regulator's perspective. And then for us as facilitators of transactions, which are highly commoditized, for me, the, the head scratch that I've been talking to a lot of people about is, you know, how do we create uniformity, substance, rigor in that diligence process? You know, Anthony quite rightly talks about greenwashing. Um, you know, it's a big concern because, you know, um, if we look at, you know, where we're looking to, to IPO a company or, you know, we're doing, we're doing some M&A, um, you know, um, how do we really test um, that, the, you know, the investment thesis of that, of that fund or that company is going, is going to, to turn out, you know, in the way that it, that it says it will. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. And then I think, you know, really picking up on Teo's point um, around, um, you know, um, sort of uh, legal regulatory landscape. I think one of the challenges we're facing as a global institution, and I'd be really interested to hear if the other panelists are, are having this, is that on the one hand, you have ESG as this global concept, this headline concept. You know, I'm I'm really proud to work for a part for uh, uh, for an organisation that's made that you know net zero commitment in terms of you know GHG by by 2050. But you know, you have to then take into account that amongst regions, amongst jurisdictions, there uh, the, the 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 focus. Uh, the landscape will be um, working at different paces of maturity um, and, and frankly will have di different um, uh, emphasis. Um, so, you know, I think uh, a one size fits all approach to ESG isn't going to work. Um, the, 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 the upside, as far as I'm concerned, is that as long as I am talking to people across the table, um, in terms of uh, my counterparts, in terms of legal counsel, external advisors, but also people outside of legal from all sorts of facets of the bank and elsewhere, then we'll try and find the middle ground, which which sort of ticks ticks both boxes. Yeah, absolutely. I think those, those are some great points, Sam. Um, I, I definitely want to come back to, to to one of those that you made, but I I, I also want to come to uh, to Judith. Um, to, to get to get your thoughts, Judith. Um, yeah, on, on on what Sam, Anthony, and, and, and Theo have, have mentioned already. But um, yeah, what, what trends are you seeing? In, you know, in, in you, you know, in your position, uh, I know you've you've had a lot of um, previous positions in the in the extractives industry, which uh, you know ESG is a, is, a, is a real key key topic, as it is with everyone. But but I think it, it potentially has been uh, you know as as CSR has kind of moved into ESG over the years. Yeah. I think obviously the extractives industry has been has been has been active in that CSR kind of path for quite some time. So yeah, please, please um, you know, do let us know, um, you know what you're struggling with at the moment, what things you're seeing, what trends you're seeing. 
Sure. Thank, thanks a lot, Tom. So I have to say that um, I think all three panelists before me have covered the key trends we're seeing. I think especially from the from the TCFD side of things, where although we see that happening in a couple of years, what it means is the banks are going to feel the pressure, which means that different industries will then have to start to put our climate risk positions forward in a more in a clearer way than we've been doing before. Two things I think we haven't really touched on that I'm seeing is the fact that there's an increased confidence from ratings agencies to take a position on risk. So it's not just what you think you're doing, it's what the market is seeing you do and what people are starting to get comfortable saying, I think this company is green, I don't think this company is green. So there's an external lens that is that we're all facing. The other point I would say is from the inside. So when I saw the poll, I wasn't surprised at all to see that there was some investor um, pressure that was driving lots of different attention we're paying to this because boards are starting to pay attention to what employees are saying. Employee acti activism is a big part of what I'm seeing. And I think in the last year as well, We've seen that one, the board is paying attention, but two employees are holding their companies accountable. So I think that need for authenticity means that there's more attention being paid, paid to what we're saying we're doing and as a function. So I proudly wear the hat for the um, compliance function and I've sat differently under the legal you know, platform and under risk and currently just independently. And I'll say that you know, from an ESG perspective, I don't think that it's broadly different to any other um, um, policies we've seen or ha ha had to get into alignment with, with whether that's SOX, whether that's, I think someone mentioned Modern Slavery Act, whether that's FCPA compliance, or even GDPR, it's how do we get aligned for what's coming down the line before we see the actual text of legislation. So I think there's going to be a lot of interaction, not just between legal and compliance, but also with risk, also with procurement, also with our, our colleagues in corporate comms as well. Everything that goes out of the door needs to be fully lined up with the board, with the C-suite, and then with ourselves as the strategy partners. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. And actually, there's, there's one thing that you said there that, I, that I'd like to, to explore a little bit further. Uh, and you mentioned about what the market is seeing you do, and I think that kind of leads us well into into the topic. And, and, and Sam and Antia both both mentioned, uh, you know, greenwashing um, and and the, the kind of the, the, the challenges around that. It's essentially, making sure that you are you are doing what you say you're doing, and you're not you know over egging um, you know those green credentials and and um, you know, the, the commitments that you're making. And I suppose yeah, you know, I'll, I'll throw this to the group. You know. Greenwashing is a, is a real risk at the moment, and, and, and as we see these these regulations come in, it, it will it will certainly not go away. Um, but how do you how would you avoid being seen to be greenwashing? What what advice can you give to, to the participants here? As uh, what can be done to, to try to avoid that, Anthony? Well, I think it's still on mute, Anthony. Yeah, I think inevitably we're going to had, had to happen at some point, I guess. Yeah, it did. Um, um, <laughs> First time this week. Uh, had to, uh, I think inevit we're obviously inevitably going to probably zero in on climate change. It is the topic of the hour. Um, but I mean, I think gr the greenwashing uh, idea, I think, also does equally apply to human rights and other r risks that we're managing in the space, just to acknowledge that. But, let but sticking with greenwashing, because it's a good, good way to, to look at it, I think some just core principles ensure you do what you say you're going to do. You know, walk the talk, not just, you know, don't just have a nice glossy brochures, but actually deliver. And one way to look at that, I think there's an increasing trend to think about this through science based targets. So, you know, try, try if you can to have KPIs that are grounded in science that is objectively, you know, and there are institutions and bodies that um, are, are supporting this. And you know, the more you can point to science based targets, the more I think you, you're going to be um, on, on safe ground. And I think also just think about it for um in the sense of what you're trying to the objective i mean again sticking with climate change net zero should be about carbon reduction if you're if you think you're solving you're doing a good job i mean okay i, I hesitate to say this because yes planting trees and investing in green initiatives through green you know uh green bonds yes yeah, it's, it's, it's got some um it's useful it's got a role to play but I think to, if you're serious about climate change, you should be reducing your carbon footprint. What you can't, where you're going to get stuck is if you 
think you can ha maintain your carbon footprint and think you're doing a good job by investing in, in carbon offsetting because it's missing the point. We all have to reduce our carbon footprint and you can't just main maintain your old ways and think you, you think it's all okay by, by, by covering it off with investments. So that's the kind of mentality I think you need to have. What, what is the objective? Well, the objective in climate change is to reduce carbon. If, if it's human rights, the objective is to, to, to do the right thing by employees and by, your, by the people working in the, your supply chain um, and, and follow that through and be able to demonstrate it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Anthony. I mean, uh, Judith, is, is there anything there that you want to add? I know you, you mentioned kind of corporate comms. Um, and there, there is, there's certainly kind of, I think, I think some discussion around around that and, and maybe kind of you're know, managing the messaging on this as well yep. as yep. as you know, doing the, as, as Anthony says, doing the right thing. But it's maybe then how we communicate that as well. I, I agree on, on the points Anthony has made. And I think it's important that whatever commitments you make as a company have to align with your long term strategy, full stop, whatever your industry is. And I think for us as um, legal compliance colleagues, we have to understand our companies, our industries, what the expectations are. Most times we will start from the what is the baseline expectation from regulators? We don't know quite yet. So we need to go back to ask the company, what are we trying to achieve in this location or with our product? So we need to understand that. But to the comment around corporate comms, I mentioned this because everyone has to be on message, whatever that message is. And that that's a part that we have to be able to flag up very early the fact that whatever we say we do, we need to at the back, you know, as you most of us have risk committees and ESG is but one risk on there. So the more we have conversations and the right folk in the company around the table really early on, when we start to say we want to do X in 2022, we start to be on message. So I think just get into the conversation early as those commitments are made is a really good practical step to take. Yeah, excellent. I think there was that was certainly something that I wanted to kind of to, to raise to the group was um you know making sure that that you know you are all involved in that in that in that process as early on as possible where those discussions are happening with with the board, with the corporate comms, with the people on the ground, you know, when you're setting those those goals, those expectations. Is is presumably making sure that you are, you're involved at that early stage to help help drive the journey of that rather than being brought in at the end. And and you know, Sam, I, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to kind of to to, to add on that. Yeah, no, definitely, and and you know, I completely agree with Judith. And in in a way, it's no surprise or coincidence that as leaders, uh, ESG has come to legal in terms of you know propelling that that conversation. That's what we should be doing. Um, early and in a meaningful way. Um, I hope that, um, you know, in certainly some of the sort of uh, products that we cover, the TD, increasing commoditization of regulation around SFDR, et cetera, will, will ease that process. But then again, you know, that's a double-edged sword because I think there is, there is, you know, frankly, room for abuse there. Um, uh, no, I, I, you know, really interesting points. And, and from my perspective, yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, we're in this sort of um, quite sensitive pitch, pinch point as far as the regulators is concerned at the moment, because, you know, we have the uncertainty of regulation. We have some ideas as to what it's going to look like. Um, but, and, you know, but on the set, by the same token, I think any grace period that regulators are giving market participants in terms of getting this right is, is you know, we're, we're, if we're not at the end, we're at the beginning of the end in terms of in terms of that grace period. Um, but then, you know, coming back to a point that Anthony made, um, something I take comfort in is, um, you know, which is maybe sort of a contrary view, is that despite the, the zeitgeist of ESG, you know, this is the the groundwork, the principles of it for me are, are a classic section one seven two, right, of, 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 of the Companies Act. This is about stakeholder you know, led decision making. Um, so, you know, I, I and, and sometimes I'll get very sort of overwhelmed or confused by the absolute barrage of thought and regulation that's coming down the pipe. And I just take it back to, uh, to, to that principle. But no, I think in terms of how do we get ready? How do we, how do we, how do we make the most and, and, and step forward in the right way? I completely agree with what the rest of the panel have said. I think the only thing from my perspective, maybe, that is equally as important is, is you know, 
completely agree you know talk you know walk the walk and you know have conviction but also it's uh it's do your homework i think um particularly you know so much of what we do is as a counterparty to a third party who you know um we may just not have that visibility that diligence as to as to you know what the knock-on effect of, of that third party has for us and I think it's about just making the most of uh, advice, um, socialising issues, um, just to, you know, some of these supply chains or um, beneficiary structures can be so complex that actually, you know, where those funds are deployed, uh, who that ultimate beneficiary is, can often be several steps removed from the client that you're interfacing with. And I'm, you know, again, very proud to be part of an institution that has best in class sort of capabilities and standards in terms of, you know, that diligence. But we're all learning here. This is this is an evolving space. So for me, it's about sort of look before you leap um, and, uh, you know, just do it, just doing your homework, because unfortunately, you know, I, I do think we will go from a situation where, um, you know, uh, the regulator sort of uh, that grace period, you know, um, will sort of flip and then, you know, there, there are going to be some, some market counterparts in the firing line, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Sam, I definitely want to come back to that point around kind of counterparties and, and managing risk and you know, what you can do there uh, shortly, because I think that's a, that's a that's a whole other topic that we can delve into uh, in a second. I did just want to come back to, uh, back to Theo to just to, just to see whether there was anything that, that you wanted to add um you know, obviously uh, anthony mentioned you know we'd be talking about greenwashing but the, the similar similar kind of you know considerations need to be applied to to kind of to human rights and modern slavery and, and just whether you had any kind of further thoughts on that that you wanted to share with the group no definitely i mean the, the same principle applies here from a human rights perspective as well and and i think what is often uh, missed and, and what's kind of at the core of of walking the talk when we and, and avoiding greenwashing when we talk about human rights is to understand that managing human rights risks is addressing risks to people and to ensure that there are better outcomes to people it's not primarily a financial risk for the company it's about addressing those impacts to people, affected stakeholders. And if you don't have that approach to your human rights work, if it's only about managing reputational risk for the company, for example, then it's just going to be about the glossy book brochures, about your sustainability reporting, and not about the actual outcomes. So that needs to be, I mean, the first step is kind of acknowledging that approach and then being able to demonstrate that approach. So going beyond the, the process of it all, not just being able to say, look, we have a policy, look, we have a, a screening process, for example, but what has that led to? Has it actually improved outcomes for people? If you're not able to demonstrate that, then it's something wrong with your process. Uh, so I think that's what needs to be kind of the key concept of, of, of addressing this from a human rights perspective. And Tom, one quick point, if I may, sticking with human rights, because um, I'm sure Theo has seen this as well. I mean, as was well product of the Modern Slavery Act, and you know, we now year on year have to do our reporting, and there are NGOs that are active. You know, year, year on year will also produce league tables of how people are performing. So it's kind of almost like self-regulation and management. So, you know, where are you on the league table, and, and shareholders and investors will look look at that as well. So, yeah. Can I pick up on that point real quick, though, because um, this is something we've had to, to your point uh, about doing it on an annual basis. Um, there was some discussion about whether we, in my companies we should talk about the, the efforts we put in last year with regards to um, the pandemic and so on and what we were expecting from our suppliers as well. And we landed in the middle point at what is the minimum requirement that we need to put in the statement versus maybe we need to put some of those good practices and works in a completely different document. So not so much the MSA. So I think, you know, coming back to the topic of greenwashing, there are times where companies are doing the right thing and it's about how they get that message out and who's paying attention maybe not so much in an MSA document but it, I mentioned the whole strategy around what is our positioning what are we doing from a long time um, strategic messaging so I know Theo's focus is very much in human rights as well I think it's all part and parcel of the messaging as well so when you do good you want to be able to show that you've done that 
yeah absolutely absolutely i think um you, something something that that uh that we've seen you know within within our business obviously is, is helping helping clients to identify those risks is that we have we do have some clients that that you know are wanting to do a, a very basic check. They, you know, they they want to show they've done something, but we also have clients that really want to find the answer. They want to dig deep. They want to, uh, you know, not only just to know that there's nothing there, but they want to know what the lay of the land is. They want to have that information to make those decisions as best they can. And I think that kind of speaks to what, what Tia was saying there um, in particular around, you know, making sure that that what you're doing is 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 addressing that need it's not just seen as a, a tick box exercise or or you know in in the case of human rights as a financial risk there there are other key key areas there that is it's essential to understand okay great well look i think now seems like a good time for us to to maybe kind of put our, our second poll question to the audience um so hopefully that's popped up for you all now so the question is which of the following would be your first priority when advising your organization on a planned ESG commitment. Uh, so either aligning with company strategy, transparency with employee and community needs, uh, clear policies and metrics to monitor performance uh, or implication for other disclosures. And again, I suspect there probably is a secret option E there, which is a, a number there, a combination of those, but um, let's see if we can pick out the, the, the most pressing um, kind of of those priorities. Give you all a little bit of time to, to answer that. Great, I hope everyone's had a chance. Um, can we see what those answers are? Okay, again, a pretty good split, but but definitely alignment with company strategy has, has come out as the clear the clear uh, the clear priority there. Um, okay, great. So um, you yeah, given those given what we've seen there, um, uh, you know, Anthony, maybe you could just give us a quick a quick idea, maybe about how how the legal function, you know, in your perspective, can uh, you know, provide value to the business through those ESG kind of assessments and, uh, and making those ESG plan commitments? So I guess two two main points to make. Um, one that I think we often forget and we need to kind of remind ourselves that as a function, we are quite unique and quite lucky in that we touch most parts of the business, if not all parts of the business, in ways that not many other functions do. And we have visibility to all the, you know, quite far visibility into the future in, in terms of the deals we do etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're very lucky so then we we should use that internal knowledge and and those contacts to really help us form a hot business form good strategies around around esg that's actually those three things i think another thing would be we're also very lucky in that we through our law firms and uh, external law firms and other contacts and big four have lots of visibility into what's coming down the pipe in terms of the regulations and the rules so i think we have some really good visibility um, that we should we can and should leverage more and i think thirdly um as external lawyers sorry in, in, in lawyers we, we also especially in the context of climate change now um have and i'm going to make a plug tom if i may for for for, for uh, someone else who's going to be speaking later in this conference in fact the so lawyers for net zero um that, that's an increasing um expand increasing an expanding group of in-house lawyers who are coming together and sharing experience about how they're tackling these problems and I mean, then there are others you know Winmark, i think is another organization and and you know, some of the law firms you know um there's lots of information out there and lots of people coming together and we as lawyers are lucky we often have these contacts which i think we can bring to the business and often from different industries we you know uh, it's great that we you know sam and, and, and i know and i know sam who's in banking and then learn from sam and, and judith and, and theo and all of that is something i can take back into the farmer and you know farmer my business but also the farmer industry more generally so i think i think we shouldn't underestimate and i think it, it someone mentioned earlier the fact that um legal it's it's all, almost our moment it's, it's a real opportunity for legal to step into the frame and and, and esg is a good platform to do that i think yeah, absolutely. I think I think it was Sam that, that mentioned that now is now is the time for legal to sort of step up for that. So yeah, Sam, is, is there anything that uh, that that kind of stood out there? Is anything that you wanted to you know, to add there? Um, yeah, for us. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. I think um, you know the one thing famous last words. Certainly, the case in my institution. You know, if 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 your organisations ensure that they have the right leaders in the right seats um 
and want to work with the right um, third parties in terms of clients, I find that the massive sort of ace up our sleeve with ESG is that we're sort of pushing on an open door um, in terms of the conversation, um, you know, uh, through, uh, you know, the zeitgeist or otherwise, you know, we're at a place in the conversation now where everyone pretty much knows what it is and that it's important. And, and there's a, you know, as I said, whilst we have to be mindful of regional differences and 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 making sure it's not a one size fits all approach, I, I I found all the conversations that I have within TD Securities, um, and and also within the organisation, um, the tribut tributaries in which ESG seems to find its way in there, and 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 how we then all come together to talk about it, I just find quite encouraging. And I, you know, in terms of sort of um, where our focus is, um, you know, particularly within financial services, what's interesting, we all, you know, we all try and be, you know, proactive as opposed to reactive and think about sort of, you know, what's coming next as opposed to, you know, drinking from, from the water hose on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, I think what's interesting for us is some of the other points that the panelists have made with that obviously, you know, the E in ESG is sort of coming towards the critical mass now. But I think that, that ESG is such a sprawling topic and the S and the G, I'm really excited to sort of unpack and see how we can progress further, particularly within financial services um, and how I can contribute as a legal function. I think that, you know, in a way it's, um, well, it's interesting because, you know, the way that the regulation is going around, around climate change, um, you know, it's, it's going to be quite corporal in terms of, uh, you know, how we mine that data, how we commoditize that data. And I think that, that with the, with the S and the G, they're going to be other challenges that will come to the fore, which which may be you know difficult to sort of navigate. But but as I said, um, you know, along with the, the, the other panelists, for me it's about socialising these ideas, getting in there early, um, uh, having having rigor, um, and I think yeah, um, we will you know we will you know prove our value in in spades to to other stakeholders. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Judith, I'm, yeah, keen to get your thoughts uh, on this. You've, you've you've been across quite a few different industries. It'd be keen keen to hear kind of how you have um, you've seen seen that value provided through those different those different industries, kind of as yeah, through the years as well. Really, what, what's changed as well? Right. So, so, so I think what I'll say is this: is the governance piece for me is critical. Um, I think that starts from just self control, self-discipline, and that is something that we, we already do day to day. So if you look at the frameworks, uh, most, most companies would at some point in the year have a risk assessment really early on. Um, what are we trying to do? What, what markets are we moving into? Where are products? And that's compliance and risk and audit and legal coming together to have a risk universe. I think the value that you know functions like ours can bring is being able to help make the strategies translatable. So let's establish the baselines. Let's plug in the landscape of we have regulation here, but we don't have regulation here. And it's around starting to get KPIs in place. And I, I, I forget who mentioned it, but we have easy access to the C-suite. We have easy access to the board as well. So we have a set of what directions they're going in. So when someone says to me, I think we should do X, you start to think really practically, can we actually monitor that? So the value I think is just being already used to setting governance teams up. What are the terms of reference? So if you have a risk committee already, you either you, you typically have the same stakeholders around the table. So you're guiding the conversation and sometimes it's easy as putting it on the agenda. So you, you, you have that internal network, you know, maybe procurement have something down the line. We need to get it on the, on the agenda. I think we had a conversation in one of the sessions earlier around electronic signatures and the fact that we're working so remotely, even, you know, um, contract signing is remote, diligence is remote. So what is the baseline we want to establish? I think those are conversations we have to have that, and we can have early by putting it on the agenda. So if there are people who drive what we're going to be discussing each quarter and you have all the right people at the table, we have the opportunity to guide that conversation really early. And I think that's something that people who are stakeholders may not have given thought to, 
but that we can guide. So what's the action that comes out of it and what's the deliverable that comes out of it? Those are ways we can guide the, the conversation so that ultimately the commitments, one, our message, but two, we start to set the baseline for how we measure it down the line. Yeah, interesting. It definitely seems like there's a kind of reoccurring theme there of, of, uh, of influence uh, and of getting in there early um, to those conversations so that you, you can influence from the start rather than trying to influence from the uh, from the end. Um, Tia, you know, we've talked a lot about the kind of the E part of ESG and, and, and Judith has talked about the G part of ESG. Um, you know, I, think you, I think your expertise kind of sits in the S part of, of ESG. Um, you know, from, from your perspective on, on that part of things around around kind of human rights um, you know, and some of the some of the associated risks there. You, is there anything different? Is there a slightly different tack that needs to be taken you know, with that? Is, is there any other considerations that people need to be aware of um, you know, when, when, when thinking about how the legal teams can provide value in those types of situations? But, uh, so I, I would say in general, I mean, I mean the, the approach is, is the same and I would agree with, with uh, the G and ESG being, being key here. And, and it's not surprising that we see in, in, the, in the discussions now with the upcoming mandatory both human rights and environmental due diligence legislation that the governance part is a key uh, uh, part of, of that kind of legislative package uh, because without the right governance structure, uh, it, these issues far too often become something standalone. And that's what I, I think it's important here to embed these issues into existing everything, if it's uh, enterprise risk management to, to other due diligence processes. And that's where the legal function often plays a, a very important role to have that overview of, of broader enterprise risk management and include ESG issues into that process to make sure that there is the right oversight and accountability within the company so it doesn't become just kind of a compliance exercise within the company, uh, but something that is demonstrable uh, outside of the company that, that it has actual impact as well. Uh, and then I, I think that to some extent, the, the legal functions should also step up in these discussions because when we, if we saw the poll and, and, and that it is a close um, connection, of course, to company strategy, but at least in my experience, I mean, the discussions on company strategy are often driven by, for example, corporate relations or the communication function or the technology function. And, and to some extent, of course, rightly so that they need to be involved. But the legal function is sometimes only saying, OK, this is I mean, we are about managing risk and we're about saying what is the law and not kind of having that more long term perspective. Uh, but I think that the legal functions are usually very well positioned to do that, but not often step up to, to be part of those discussions. So I think what I, I would really like to see more from the legal functions is to not just talk about kind of minimizing risk exposure, but also maximizing the potential of using legal frameworks to have an impact. Uh, so being more proactive, being part of those strategic discussions and thinking beyond minimizing risk. Uh, and, and that is hopefully going to be a shift in, in that direction uh, with more uh, um, uh, mandatory and, and, and uh, uh, clear requirements. Can I add to that, if I'm of if I might fit, Teo? I, th I think that's spot on. And, and you know, it's, uh, again, it's, it's hopefully doing what we're, what we're good at and what, and what in-house councils should be doing. And I think that, in my space and in a lot of other spaces that I'm seeing, we're lucky because um, uh, implementing ESG in terms of what our clients are interested in, what customers are interested in, um, you know, is a way to generate alpha, to, to generate revenue. So we um, uh, playing a part in that conversation and putting as Judith quite rightly said, you know, ESG at the top of the agenda is, I think, going to be, you know, hopefully music to the ears of, of stakeholders in the bank, because that's how, and, 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 and your businesses, because that is how we are going to grow the business. That's how the business is going to survive um, and, and, and hopefully flourish. So, you know, hopefully everyone's, you know, pointing in the, in the right direction. Yeah, fantastic. I think that dovetails quite into 
into kind of another question that I wanted to put to the group, and, and I think you know, Teo touched on this um, you know, in, in terms of um, you know, embedding these these questions and this, these these elements in, in, into those risk management processes and into due diligence. Um, but, but really, you know, one thing I wanted to throw out to the group, and I think you know, this would be of particular interest to the participants, is how do you test those ESG credentials, those activities, um, as part of that due diligence process? Um, it, what, what have you each been doing around around that level? Um, and maybe Tia, if we could start with you. Uh, sure. So um, I think that's a very, of course, important question and goes back to, to our initial discussion of, of, of not greenwashing and, and moving away from, from nice statements. Uh, so I think what you need to ask yourself is to be able to evaluate kind of the quality of the due diligence itself. So not just, again, looking at the process itself, but what does it achieve and what could be indicators of a qualitative due diligence. Uh, so of course, I mean, from my perspective, when we, when we look at it from, from a human rights perspective, uh, we need to be able to, to look at issues such as, I mean, is there meaningful stakeholder consultation and dialogue, for example, as part of a due diligence process? Where is it just something internal within the company? Uh, is it the right, does the right governance structure in, in terms of accountability exist? which then enables remedy, for example. So is there a commitment to remedy and can you demonstrate that you have provided remedy in cases where there is an actual impact, for example? Because it's easy to say we respect human rights, but when something happens, if you're not prepared to take your responsibility to enable remedy and acknowledge that you have had an impact, then, I mean, that commitment isn't, isn't worth much. Uh, so there has actually been a lot of work done now over just the last uh, year or so in connection to, to the, the regulatory discussions and the legal development to identify those kind of qualitative due diligence indicators. And, and I think that is important to feed into the uh, regulatory discussions to make sure that the requirements actually focus on those indicators. So it doesn't just become a, I mean, we come back to this, the tick box exercise, it's not, not just become an internal compliance issue, uh, but that we have those qualitative indicators. Um, and and of, of course that's challenging. And, and I think to some extent, it's maybe also moving away from a, a approach that many companies have and it's not, surprising that they have had it to just, um, I mean, f just being focused on uh, disclosure and transparency because previous regulatory requirements have focused on that. The Modern Slavery Act, the Dodd-Frank Act, mm. uh, all of these are mainly focused on just disclosure. There is no I mean, kind of requirement behind that as long as you disclose. But now we're moving beyond that. It's actual due diligence requirements, liability. So that means that you need to be prepared to not just uh, disclose what you're doing, but actually also be able to disclose that you're having a, a, a positive impact. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very uh, yeah, powerful change there, I think, and, and that will drive a, a big change in behavior. Um, Sam, I wanted to come back to, to a comment that, that you made earlier around kind of managing, managing those risks with the third parties and, and beneficiaries. And I think, um, you know, how, how are you addressing that you know, within your business? Um, you know, in terms of the due diligence uh, and, and understanding you know, what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. Yeah, sure. And, and again, um, you know, we're lucky that um, the counterparties that we tend to be engaging with, you know, whether they are deep institutional partners that, you know, we've been working with for decades or, um, you know, uh, new clients that, that we're partnering with maybe for the first time, we're lucky that that, that commitment um, is, is at the bedrock of what they're doing um, uh, uh, in much the same way as it is with us. So there is a common language, a common focus. Um, so, so I think that, will, that already puts us a couple of steps ahead um, when, when we're, you know, we're... Um, we're looking at that exercise. I think for me, it's about, um, you know, again, bringing it back to my, you know, for better, one of the phrase, 10 commandments of being a good in-house counsel, a good partner, a good, a good value add. I think it's about, um, 
Um, I, I heard a phrase the other day, which I thought was quite good, um, uh, being, I think, um, a skeptical optimist um in terms of how we look at these opportunities and just you know um just always sort of um you know being open to to um these these new products or you know clients that have this fantastic vision for how they can contribute to the esg landscape and they'd like us to try and help them to to achieve that but just yeah just just applying um that 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 scrutiny and and constructive rigor much in the same way as i would be with frankly any other opportunity or situation that i'm going to be evaluating and opining on as a as a control function within the bank i think that um there are challenges with 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 esg in terms of where it's at at the moment in terms of um the parameters of the law and regulation in terms of its not a binary exercise to know whether you are you know um it, it, uh, compliant with 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 um certain regulations or not um i'm yep. hoping you know it sooner rather than later that's a lot of that's going to crystallize um yep. but it's yeah it's about um utilizing all of the tools at my disposal working with clients as opposed to you know um in a adversarial uh, way but yeah just just sort of being curious i think um uh, remaining curious about about um uh, the opportunities that are put to us um, yeah, is, is, is the best way that i can think about it oh yeah thanks sam um judith i think you you, you wanted to, to to come in there yeah, I just wanted to say real quick on the back of Theo's comment around more qualitative looks, look at um, disclosures. I think with, you know, uh, third party partners and due diligence, it's really about what's important to you in the absence of any clear regulation at this point, you need to make sure that they're aligned with your values. And it's about asking the right questions. I think when we go externally to due diligence providers such as yourself, we're paying attention to negative news, not just what has been disclosed, because um, in my industries, I'm finding that employee interest is very high. So we're looking at things such as um, exec comp, we're looking at gender pay, we're looking at cybersecurity, all of those data points, I think, come together to let you know if you want to be with that third party, wh wh whether it's a partner or a supplier. I think just the qualitative checkup, are we aligned, is something you have to do for your company, for your industry. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. I think yeah, just just a, just a, sorry, 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 I was add very, very quickly. I, I, that's such a good point. And also, I think that we need to make sure that, um, you know, we're putting our service providers through their paces to make sure that we have state of the art, intelligent ways of, of, of dredging that data. Because to your point, the, the days of a Google search and you're done, are, well, if they're ever there, they're not anymore. Uh, I think just to, just to elaborate on what, on what Judith said there, you know, the, uh, the, the conversation that needs to happen with those service providers, I think is really important because um, you know, each, I'm sure each of you have slightly different kind of priorities and key areas you know, for each of those individual situations that you're looking at that you want to know more about and, and articulating that to your, to your providers to make sure they're focusing on those elements is, is really important. Um, we've got one question to answer from the panel. I just wanted to go to Anthony just to see if there's anything else you wanted to, to, to add there, Anthony. Just very quickly, I mean, I think um, building off what, what others have said, I mean, different different horses for courses, as they say. I mean, for human rights, it's incredibly complex to, to get into the risks. I think the multiple data points and cross-referencing them, I think, is one way to to try and further up, get to those, you know, test those. I think for climate change, it's perhaps a bit more easy because you've got some objective criteria, some scientific-based measurements you can do. And we should be obviously looking at that. And I think just one final point, I think DD, you can look at it in two ways. One is an organization as a supply chain compliant, but I think also increasingly we need to think of DD in the context of acquisitions and targets. And that's a, a bigger question because it's like strategically, where is the target now? Where is it going to be in the context of all the issues we're talking about? And having having the vision, I think again, legal can play an important part there, having to, to kind of get into that vision and just to see whether they're, they're set up for the, success in the future i think it's going to be really important as we go forward great yeah absolutely yeah thank you anthony okay great well look, we've got a question from uh, from the panel that i wanted to uh, sorry a question for the panel that i wanted to to put to you all 
uh, just very briefly, we've, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, so a, a senior GC recently said that there are pledge wars happening. Uh, and you could say that the net zero uh, arena at the moment is a bit of a wild west. How do you think in-house council can help their business achieve legitimate net zero? Anyone wants to take that one to start with, yeah. Anthony? Can I jump in? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, it's a good question from Adam. Um, I, I think it's back to some of the things he said earlier. It's, it's, it's about basing your, your objectives um, on um, real targets that are demonstrable and measurable. But I think it's also about thinking about what, what are the objectives? And I think it's also about, uh, i.e. carbon reduction is not, it's not just about offsetting, it's about reducing carbon. But also I think it's also about to, to, be, to be legitimate, being prepared to test ourselves and ask the hard questions. The reality of it is, without getting too political, we're gonna to have to move away from a consumer, consumer growth based economy. That's, that's the reality if we're going to re dramatically re reduce net zero. And those kind of hard decisions are, are going to be tough. And I think, because you can look at some of the easy easy wins, you can reduce your carbon footprint in the short term, but in the long term to get to the, to the ultimate objective of 1.5% um, or lower in, in the time frame we have, we're going to have to make some pretty tough decisions in business and in society. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, any of our other panelists want to, anything else to add to that? I think just to say real quick, it's about understanding the issues yourself, understanding the science, not just as a GC, but for your whole function as well. And that way you're able to challenge when you see commitments that are not authentic coming through your own organization. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Judith. Well, look, I think um, we're, we're, we've run out of time now. Uh, I think we've had a, a great discussion. There's been some really interesting key takeaways, I think. Um, you're utilizing your, your position as, as as general counsels to that, that touch all those different parts of the business. Uh, you use that to your advantage. Uh, KPIs and objectives that are supported by by science based targets, and I think then you're focusing on that governance to to help drive change through the rest of the organisation is is key. So, um, I want to thank all of the uh, all of our panelists today who joined us. Thank you all as well uh, for joining us um, for this session. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion uh, and enjoy the rest of the event. So, thank you very much. And thank you, Tom. Over to you. Thanks, Thanks Tom, for that Thank you. Thank you all. I'll echo Tom's thanks to, to Teo, Sam, Judith, and Anthony. Um, please stay tuned for our next session. Uh, and I see uh, the panelists already uh, lined up. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Angie. How are you? I'm delighted. I'll try to, to speak in many voices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who, who, who do not know Antia, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Antia Peterson, uh, who's General Counsel of Serum Tech, um, to this event. Um, she uh, is an academic by training, an attorney by choice, um, <laughs> and I am very much looking forward to her keynote speech on the road to compliance. Um, whistleblowing is a, is of particular interest to me, and I know to many folks in the audience, because we're I'm not sure how quickly people jump from one call to, to another. Maybe we'll give it 30 seconds for Antia to Absolutely. gather her thoughts. Absolutely. And yes. then I will um, hand over to you, Antia. And I'm going to start pulling up my presentation. You'll have to feed back to me if it can be seen. I actually I will give you a thumbs up. left my home office to prevent the cat from walking across the screen. And I'm encountering a bit of... Uh, bandwidth uh, issues at the office so there you go <laughs> i outsourced my puppy is... today to avoid um uh, you know, additional distraction at home there you go this is we all try to do it that way it should be coming up in a second uh we can see a screen but it is uh, it is Hang on. yes we can see your desktop now and oh, here we are this is good this is super you should see a cover page. We have it, and it is um, 1654 now. So I think we can safely say we can join. We have a, a significant number okay. of people dialed in. And here, All over right. to you. Well, I'll just do a quick introduction. So.
So I'm the general counsel for Ceramtech, a um, manufacturing company based in Germany. I'm not the compliance officer. I do not have compliance in, in my domain, so to speak, but have a great and, and enthusiastic interest for compliance and also strongly believe that compliance and legal are absolute sibling disciplines who are dependent on each other and uh, who have their best interests, the best interests of the company at heart. So I'm just delighted to be here and uh, catch at least part of, of these wonderful presentations. So Ceramtec, just by way of introduction, I said we are a manufacturer, we make advanced ceramics for industrial and medical applications, which means our products can be found in cars and sewing machines, in coffee makers, in planes, in uh, cars, I think I mentioned that already, and in people. So that's extremely diverse and uh, quite a universe to capture also uh, from a compliance perspective. But our topic today is the EU whistleblower directive. And what I'd like to do, I have no uh, insight yet into how many companies that are represented here have actual hotlines already and uh, how many still need to or are thinking about uh, implementing them shortly. So what I want to do with this particular presentation is to poke those who have hotlines to review them in light of the obligations or the, the terms of the whistleblower directive. And of course, to enthuse those who don't have them, and maybe imbue uh, you guys with some arguments on how to get one, uh, get a hotline in the near future. I'd also like to create a level playing field between those who will only review and those who will greenfield uh, under the directive. I think there's lots of overlap because let's face it, when we all, for those of us who implemented hotlines, we did so mostly in a true greenfielding sense without much direction what they should look like. And I think the directive now gives us some good pointers that are actually based on some universal experiences. I think when you see some of these conditions that are now being put on companies, you will recognize them as something that you may have already done as best practice in the past. So um, that's what we're going to try to level out between those who have one and those who don't have one. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the philosophy behind the directive, uh, definitely about some basics of the directive, and then uh, generally go into what will be relevant for you when you set up or review uh, your own hotline. What I'd like to point out about the directive before we even go into it is, you're probably only going to meet it once at the front end when you set up or review, and then you're gonna maintain your system, you're gonna be answering uh, the reports, you're going to be engaged in, closing reports or interacting with whistleblowers and you won't even think about the directive anymore because you have your system implemented. When it comes back will be if there is an issue, if a whistleblower feels retaliated against, if, if there's anything like that that comes up, you will have to go back to the directive and delve more deeply into the protections uh, that the whistleblowers will get. So front end, back end, in between, have, you will hopefully happily operate your hotline. Okay, let's just look at the basic uh, reference. Hang on. So this is where you find the directive. Um, it's easy to find, you can Google it, but here's the actual site. And unfortunately, you also have to check all of the national implementation legislations that apply to you. I have not done a survey of where those implementation legislations have already been implemented. You, you will unfortunately have to look for your own, but just bear in mind that the directive provides the minimum of what needs to be done and that a number of countries have not issued anything and that ultimately when you fashion your system, you will have to look to the national implementation legislation that applies to you. 
In absence of uh, legislation in at least a number of countries, I have simply uh, written down a, a recent development. We have a new ISO 37002 on whistleblowers, which you may also want to look to for guidance. I'm not going to be talking about it today, but I think as you attempt to set up a state-of-the-art system, you will probably be grateful for any help you can get from uh, experienced um, hotline developers as would be enshrined in the ISO 37002. Uh, Anila, let's go to our first polling question. I wanna really know, I would like to understand what the distribution in the audience is, who has a hotline and who doesn't. I somehow assume we have a lot of happy hotline owners, but I don't know. So let's see. Great, I'll just give it 10 more seconds and I'll launch yeah. the answers. Unfortunately, I cannot see the, um, the poll itself, but you'll let me know where it comes out. Yeah. Okay, just ending poll now. Okay. Sharing the results. So 91% have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and 9% have said no, so quite a clear right. there. Okay, I thought so. I think this is exactly what I thought would happen. So uh, for you and the 91%, please, whenever I, I talk about the obligations under the directive, uh, just take it as my recommendation to go to the directive and its requirements and to review your own um, hotline as it's set up right now. And then hopefully there's not going to be a big delta, but... Um, it definitely bears going back to the directive and reviewing your hotline. All right, let's delve into a couple of dates. Um, as we have 91% with, with hotlines already, uh, the application dates of the directive will not shock you. If you have more than 249 employees, you should be ready by 17th December 2021. And if you have somewhere between 50 and 249 employees, you have a bunch more time until 2023. Again, I'm assuming with the audience here that everybody is looking towards the 17th of December, 2021. Um, what I would think though is with not much national implementation legislation being on the books yet, and in analogy maybe with things like the experience from GDPR where Generally, it is understood on all levels that instituting compliance systems and doing it properly takes a lot of time, cost, and effort. I would not expect any kind of enforcement to happen on the 17th of December 2021, which should be a good fact for all of us. All right, let's go into a couple of uh, details. But before we do that, I told you I wanted to give you a little bit about the background uh, of the philosophy behind the directive. I think it's important to keep it in mind because not everything is prescribed in the directive. And if you think about the philosophy behind the directive, it will also be able to guide you in some decisions that you'll have to make in, in implementing or revising your hotline setup. Uh, clearly, the directive was geared at creating homogeneity in the EU with respect to the effective, affected laws. Uh, it was also created to um, have efficient and confidential reporting channels. And of course, last but not least, as it's already uh, in the title, the effective protection of whistleblowers. And all of it, the impetus behind it, it's grounded in the right to freedom of expression. And I think if you go through the directive time and again, you will see this sort of peeking through and uh, it's something that can guide us also in implementing and reviewing our hotlines. First of all, Let's talk briefly about some definitions and scope uh, so that we know what's in. Although we will talk about scope and definitions, um, remember what I said at the beginning, it's going to, the directive is going to be important in setting up your hotline or reviewing your hotline. And then again, at the end, if something goes wrong, as we all know, the big in between is not going to be about exactly the scope of the directive. 
you are going to get reports uh, from people who may not fall under the directive, and you're going to get reports with respect to laws or regulations that don't fall under the directive. You're going to apply your hotline equally to everyone. Uh, I think that's the only pragmatic thing anyone could do. But let's look at some of the definitions. So it's interesting that the definition of whistleblower is very broad in the directive. It's really anyone having to do with the work, with the activity that a company does. So it's not only current employees, it's also past employees, retirees, for example, but also potential employees. Meaning if a job applicant comes to your campus and they see something that they want to report, they would absolutely enjoy the protection of the directive. But it goes even further than that. It's also third parties providing services to the company. It could be, it could be consultants, really anyone who can say something meaningful about the conduct of the company. Uh, I wrote down facilitators as well, because if there is, for example, if there were to be um, a dispute between a whistleblower and a company, and there's a facilitator assisting the whistleblower in the dialogue, even the facilitator would be covered. So that's very broad coverage. Um, who is not covered? Uh, the directive calls it the citizen bystander. It's uh, the citizen bystander, somebody from the outside who really has nothing to do with the company, but sees, sees a wrong or a potential wrong, because it's also a potential wrong, uh, is not covered. Because again, the protection is behind the philosophy uh, of the directive. And this, the civic bystander does not run the risk of having retaliation applied to them. Moving on to the scope that's covered in terms of the laws, um, I want to say it's actually everything that is considered to be EU law. There are 10 enumerated policy areas, top 10 areas, if you will, and a special focus on financial interests of the EU or the internal market, so competition law and, and things like that. But remember, your, your average whistleblower is not going to know whether they're reporting on a violation of EU law or whether they are reporting on something else or, or internal regulations, for example. So. Um, just because you have a hotline that you institute under, under the whistleblower directive doesn't mean that it's going to stay within the scope of the whistleblower directive. You're going to get the garden variety reports. And I would presume that at the end of the day, uh, you will rarely, if ever, make that analysis if a whistleblower actually concretely falls under the directive or later under the national implementation legislation, because you will want to treat all whistleblowers equally. I think it would have to be a large and complicated case where you would take the position that someone is not covered and in the day to day, you would apply it to everyone who calls in. Um, let's move on to the protection of the whistleblowers. Um, what do you actually have to protect? I think retaliation is, is the big uh, buzzword that everybody knows about, but the directive sets out um, some very specific additional protections that you have to give, uh, all under the condition that your whistleblower is a true whistleblower. And a true whistleblower must believe that the facts as they report them are true at the time when they are reporting them. Uh, very central that this is the precondition for the protection. Uh, if someone, for example, reports something that's already in the public domain or that's simply a rumor and nothing else, they would not be afforded the protection under the directive. As to some of the more specific um, protections, The confidentiality, for example, the there are some exceptions to that. 
Um, the whistleblower is not going to be held liable if they accidentally or intentionally disclose some confidential information, which disclosure might actually violate their employment agreement. And uh, the whistleblower may, may um, ask for a personal meeting, specific personal meeting um, by way of calling the hotline and saying, I want to meet with someone and that must be afforded. But from a formalistic or, or formal point of view, procedural point of view, most importantly, if retaliation occurs or were to occur, the whistleblower does not need to prove the causation between the act of calling the hotline and the retaliation. Instead, the burden of proof is reversed and the company has to prove that it was not retaliation. What that means for all of us is if there ever is or where to be um, an employment proceeding going on or employment activity, um, disciplining activity or something alongside with an active uh, whistleblower report, uh, that's still possible. If you have a different and well-grounded reason to discipline an employee, you can still do that, but you have to document 100% why that is and why that has nothing to do i think there's some issue with the with sound the report and the so the reporting oh okay can you hear me now and it's fine now. I think it just froze for a couple of seconds, but we're all good to go okay. now. Okay. Thank you. That would be the famous bandwidth. <laughs> just, just interrupt me if that were to happen again. Um, okay. Going into the reporting modes, there are three. Uh, there is internal, external, and the publication to the press or to the social media. Uh, internal is really what would be favored by us as companies. We want to keep it close to the vest. We want to keep it in the family if we possibly can. It's also sort of favored by the directive, uh, not, not too strongly. Um, external is when you, we actually go or we have a, have a whistleblower turn to the EU authorities. Those two modes are called reporting modes. Um, publication to the press is called disclosure. It's, it's not actually a, technically a reporting mode. And it is um, it's an interesting animal because it's not prohibited under the directive and it's not required that a whistleblower goes first to the internal reporting and then to the external reporting. Disclosure by publication is allowed if, for example, a whistleblower believes that there is imminent danger of public policy or a reason or something, or if they really truly fear uh, retaliation uh, internally or from an, from an external reporting mechanism. That's gonna be kind of hard to prove, but I think what that means in practice is uh, it's gonna be very hard um, to prevent or, or to encourage someone not to report publicly. And, and remember that's, that's also social media that could be used. Um, so, the other thing is you have to be careful not to hinder publication. When you inform your employees of all the reporting modes, you have to make it clear that there are three, not just one, not just the internal reporting. If you do hinder in any way, there are penalties um, that can be put on the companies. There are also penalties for, for a whistleblower who knew that the information they gave was false. But um, again, I think for us in, in our roles as reviewing our current hotlines, uh, we wanna make sure that we present those reporting modes um, all as they are understood by the directive. Maybe uh, one quick word about external. Um, you have the ability not only to have an internal system that you yourself have in-house, but of course you can also use external help in, in setting up um, a hotline. You can have an ombudsman, which would be an external way of doing internal reporting. It's different from external reporting to the EU authorities, 
And those terms sometimes get mixed up and we will see that, uh, or at least a, a potential for where we mix up might be in, in just a second. Let's take a quick look at what you really need to do in reviewing your hotlines or establishing new ones. Um, your duties as a company are, of course, to establish the hotline, to, to run it, to administer it, and follow a certain procedure that's laid out in the directive in terms of answering, investigating, and closing reports. Um, very important that the directive actually names some time periods. You have to answer within seven days, and you should really try to close reports within three months. Um, I think if there are good reasons, you can extend that. And I don't know about you, but when you look at statistics, I wish every report could be closed in, in three months, but I think uh, that's a tall order. Again, documented why you might not be able to close it in three months. And I would think uh, that should be okay. Um, have a quick look at the last point, which is also one of your obligations, ensuring the adequate information uh, and reporting mechanisms. I think the reporting mechanisms are easy. Ensuring the adequate information may be a little harder. We'll look at that uh, in a couple of minutes in more detail. Um, remember that the signposting can, can happen in many settings and that not only you will see it, but other people as well. Quick roadmap, uh, which most of you won't need. Um, we're now um, accustomed to the number 249 employees for those who have to have a hotline by December 17th. And I simply, on this chart that you cannot read now because it's way too small, but hopefully you'll have access to the presentations later on. Uh, I just jotted down a couple of the checkpoints or on, on the roadmap that you really need to have in mind as you as you look at your hotline. Uh, toggle points where you can think about again, I'm, am I administering the hotline in a way I really want to? And there are three points that are uh, always important to me. One is who actually administers the hotline because you have several options. It could be legal, it could be compliance, it could be HR, it could be in finance, it could be with internal audit. I really think the sky is the limit. Um, but it has some ramifications. Um, who, who sees the information first? Who assigns it? Um, is there a good understanding of the sort of major reports that would need to go to legal to ensure that there's also legal privilege? Uh, is it mostly HR and will be done by HR, investigated or taken care of by HR? Those are all considerations. And what I would suggest here, particularly in the smaller companies, don't just take one department, make it a communal effort, take two or three. It will also help with coverage during, uh, during vacation times. And it will give you the other perspective that you may not have in allocating investigations or reviews to the right person. Also, second point, in some countries, you have to involve the Works Council um, to make sure that they are aware of exactly the uh, confines of your, of your hotlines and its workings. And then, of course, data protection issues also loom large. There are personal data involved of not only the whistleblower, but also the people on whom a report is being made and uh, a good data protection notice um, relating to the program is uh, I think not only a good idea, but a must. Um, I will go quickly through some of the hurdles um, that stand in your way when you want to uh, implement a hotline because 91% of you already know all of those hurdles, the high costs, um, what I call the snitch factor, which, which I think has, has become a lot better over the years. I think uh, people are reporting more and more and there's a less of a feeling that you're pointing at someone and uh, that it's sort of dégoûtant to, to use a hotline. Um, let me just highlight a couple like hallway reporting. Uh, a hotline to me is all nice and good, but if somebody stops you in a hallway, do you have a system that you can take a report that you receive, whatever, in the hallway, in the kitchen, that you can properly lodge it and 
and also make sure that it's investigated and, and treated exactly like any other report and taken into the statistics. I think every system relating to a hotline needs to also contemplate that um, reports will not go directly into the hotline or directly to legal or compliance where somebody with knowledge would, would uh, include them in the hotline reports, but also come to you in some more sort of crooked ways. Uh, also important uh, is how you, how you make your case when you have a hotline to management. How do you bind in management and make sure that they understand what's going on in the company in terms of reports that are coming in, that they can keep supporting you and that they can keep um, helping the system get better and better. And we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes too. But now let's move to what, on to what the actual requirements are. Uh, here too, in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight, you can read this and, and you're uh, already familiar, 91% of you are definitely familiar with this and the others I'm sure as well. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of things that are new under the directive or important under the directive. And that is posting the information, how to reach the hotline and what to do and what the protections are. I would argue that everyone needs to take a good look at what's being posted in terms of this kind of information. Uh, it probably needs to be rather extensive. There'll be deliberations whether you can post it only internally um, at the walls and on your intranet, et cetera. Um, or um, if you have your hotline references on your, on, on your website, if you post all of that information also there, I think almost the latter, because you remember that also third party providers uh, may be given the protection of whistleblowers. So technically, I think that means that you have to do a rather broad um, broadcast uh, of that information. But remember also once it's on the on the website, everybody can see it and everybody can can comment on it, whether it's complete or not. So that's definitely one uh, one assignment that I would take very, very seriously. Uh, I went online and um, had time to do click, click, click and, and look for an example and um, a, really it was a random example and ended up being VW and I'm going to um, pull it in for a second so that you can see it. I hope it's big enough. Um, what you can see is that uh, VW already here has some extensive information on their whistleblowing system. And at first when I looked at it and I, I thought, oh wow, it's already adapted to the directive because it talks about internal and external reporting. When I looked more closely though, it appears to me just to be the fake external reporting maybe through an ombudsman. So both in the category of internal reporting, either in-house or with the help of an external uh, outfit. And that this is probably not yet adapted to the directive. The other thing that I was interested in is it took me six scrolls to go to, to get to this particular point. I have no KPIs on whether six scrolls is too much or six clicks or whatever, but it's definitely something that you want to keep in mind if, um, if it may just be too complicated to get to your hotline information. Uh, let's get now to the next polling question. Again, Anila, I'm not going to be able to see it. I would like to just get some measures for success that we can talk about. Um, if you think about the philosophy behind the directive and the company's interest in risk management, we should have as many reports as possible. That would only be a given. But what really is, um, is a good measure for getting reports? How do you know that you're getting uh, a sufficient number of reports? That's going to be our next polling question. Okay. So I have put the polling questions up. If your company has a whistleblower system, how many reports approximately do you receive per year? A, 0 to 10, B, 10 to 50, C, 
Oh my God, way more than 50? Or lastly, D, I would rather not say. So I'm not now going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, tell me. Oh, it's, it's kind of an even split. So 0 to 10, 28%, 10 to 50, 33%. And then OMG, way more than 50, 22%. I would rather not say 17%. Okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, um, very interesting that it's distributed that way. And also very interesting because how much can we tell actually? Whoops, I can... This is not, hang on a second. My system's not letting me go to the next page. So, no, hang on. Here we go, there. Yeah, how do you, how do you know? How do you know what's a good number? And, and of course our, our polling question did not have the context. Um, how many employees do you have? What kind of reports these were? Were these 80% HR related reports about I don't like my supervisor? How many uh, SOX type violations were in there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think from, from the impression I have gained and from the things I've heard and the things I've asked about, there is still no really good KPIs on how many reports you should get. It seems to be that um, the only way right now to gauge this is reports by employee. And I've simply given you a couple of excerpts here from, from reports on what's been found to be the numbers that occurred in 1918, 2018, 2019, around that time. And it seems to be if you have somewhere north of one report per 100 employees, you're doing okay. And you can now take your polling answer and do the math in your head by, by taking your employee number of employees and see if you're somewhere in the ballpark. I, I find this absolute number somewhat problematic because of course you've probably also experienced what I've experienced in the past. There are regions that are much more active about reporting like the United States for me always had higher numbers of reports people were um, less inhibited, I have to say, about reporting. Europe was always lower. Um, Asia is picking up, has been picking up in the last few years. It's a very incongruent picture. So um, if you want to report, if you want to report KPIs to your management, it's going to be hard because if you just take that number for 100 employees, to me, that's just the beginning. Okay. Other, um, other KPIs have to come in, in terms of type of report, region, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we've talked about all the obligations and the needs and what do you have to do, et cetera. I'm very quickly going to talk about what I would call the wants. And I'm not gonna spend time on this because it's basically uh, something you already know, just put together on one slide that if you want to, you can consult at the right time. Uh, what I mean with the want is uh, you can't just have a hotline, you have to have a hotline procedure as well. That's my personal opinion. This is where you write it all down, point number one, to document that you've done what you need to do under the directive or the national implementation legislation, if you ever have to prove it. And number two, if you, if you write a procedure like this, it's going to tickle out all of those toggle features where you, where you have um, a path this way or a path that way, where the directive doesn't tell you exactly how you should do it, but where you basically make a cultural decision. So that's simply a recommendation. You would create transparency. And believe me, you'll make your life easier. For example, when it comes to who investigates, who takes over, when does legal take over, what is, in, what is dealt with by the mother ship, the parent company, what is dealt with by subsidiaries, et cetera, et cetera. These are always bones of contention. And I think with the procedure that has a lot of buy-in that, that includes a lot of departments that way, and you're gonna make your life a lot easier. Okay, final. <laughs> Final polling question, which I really think we, we may not need, but let's, let's ask it anyway, because it asks about those who don't have a hotline, um, 
uh, are there plans to to get one in the near future? And I don't mean December 17th, because that's just a couple months away, but let's say near future in the next few months. Uh, the polling question is up. If your company has no whistleblower reporting system and you fall under the directive, are you in the process of planning to implement under one in the not too distant future? Yes, no, or I would rather not say. And um, so I think we can end the poll. We've got we've got results. So hundred percent yes. Okay. Mm. Super. Glad to hear it. All right, then moving right along, we are finally here um, for a short summary, um, really <laughs> trying to emancipate you from the directive. <laughs> the directive is important, we have to follow it, but, but the hotline requirements uh, for a hotline that actually works and, and gives you good results are so much more. We've already talked about KPIs. You should, you should shoot for as many reports as possible. Um, if you, if you want many reports, you have to have a compliance program around the hotline. That's the hotline. The hotline needs to be embedded like a spider in a web in an efficient and well-functioning compliance program. You can't have a standalone hotline without a compliance program around it. Uh, the trust won't be there and your hotline won't save you from compliance issues if you don't have a program around it. Um, obviously, if you have no buy-in from, from management and employees, uh, nothing is going to work. So go ahead, make a campaign, maybe now as you review your existing hotlines, take it as an occasion to, to market the system again and drum up reports and encourage people to trust and to call in if they really have a concern. Because as we all know, we'd much rather talk to our folks than uh, to meet them in some other setting with the concerns that they have. And then finally, create some, uh, some KPIs so that you can prove, I think this, this came up in, in previous sessions as well, create your KPIs, think them through so that you can prove that this is a win-win for your organization, for your company. And finally, finally, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the directive is just the floor. The requirements under the directive are just the floor create up from the floor. And I think what you will see is that your hotline is going to be a powerful tool if you ever have to document the adequacy of your compliance program. Again, assuming you have a good compliance program around it, but a good hotline and many reports will be definitely a testament to the fact that you do have an adequate program. And last but not least, um, I think it's hard to talk about uh, whistleblower hotlines if you have questions without disclosing too much about your company. So I've simply put down my email address and would invite you to dialogue uh, by email if you like. Um, I think that might be an easier dialogue, but whatever works for you. Okay, and I would... Thank you so try. much, Hans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello again. Now, do we have um, do we have specific questions for Ant here? I, I, oh, I'm not seeing I anything in the Q and A, but I but I have certainly a question. <laughs> um, I was surprised by the answers to one of the polling questions, um, and it encourages me that maybe whistleblowing. Uh, systems are, are, are much better than they used to be. Historically, and I'm talking 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, we used to see clients coming to us drowning in irrelevant disclosures that were coming through their whistleblowing pr um, sort of process, mainly HR related issues. You know, somebody mm -hmm. has stolen my plants, my chair has yeah. moved, I'm unhappy with this. <laughs> My um, sandwich was stolen. <laughs> yes. And it, it, the danger were there, of course, was that all that noise threatened to hide the one genuine sort of report that, that did need follow up. Um, so, Antje, why do you think, what do you think has happened to make the system so much better at, at filtering, given the polling answers we have today? 
very hard to know because I have none of the context. <laughs> but first of all, I, I would argue that there's still a lot of noise um, in terms of HR related complaints in any kind of whistleblowing system. I think that's just part of the course that that, that continues to go. And I think it the noise is also important because you can't expect a whistleblower to know at all times what is relevant, what we want to see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not us going, hey, I really want to focus on the important stuff. So go away with a, with a stolen sandwich or something. So the noise is necessary to lower the threshold, to trust the hotline to report things. But if I, if I were to try an answer, I would say that people really have done speak up campaigns and that they have said, take the hotline for this, but really go to your supervisor first, go to, um, go to the compliance department. I think compliance departments have done a tremendous amount not to be these um, uh, small departments that, that were sort of put in from above, but to go into, um, into the public of, of the company to talk with people. Tr they train them when em employees start, they talk with them, they have really an open ear. And that's the only explanation I have, that the speak up campaigns really have, have uh, done their job. Thank you, Antje. And I have some questions from the audience. Um, first, I, can you give, can you show an example of the external EU authorities that could be shared with the audience, please? Yeah, for example, competition authorities, they have already now a hotline, um, a, a hotline installed and that will continue to be uh, active. But um, a, a number of other authorities, I, I, can't even, I can't even name them, but um, they too have to uh, install the hotlines and have exactly the same obligations as the companies. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what, what they all are. Uh, and then through the miracle of technology, I believe Alexander in the audience is going to be able to ask a question live if we get all that Oh, working. my God. <laughs> no, just you know, one, one comment on question. I mean, I was working before in compliance with a previous company. And then you mentioned, um, you know, somehow that the number of reports as a KPI. I just think that the value, I mean, you have all kind of global reports, a uh, number of reports per thousand of employees. I think... Because often you end up experience that uh, the majority, or at least fifty percent, of allegations are HR related. Yeah, some from right. bullying up to you know, harassment yeah. and all these cases. So first of mm -hmm. all, to be careful with, if, especially if you're working in, in a larger group, um, you have a regional or global um, responsibility, that you make sure that HR okay, this is going to be delegated to HR. I mean, I've always said okay, clearly as an African company, you have to take this up, and sometimes have got allegations mixed both HR. Or bribery and so on. So this is one point, um, and um, uh, and and uh, but the metrics. I think it's more interesting to see uh, where do you have material deviations. Yeah, in terms of particular, you know, it's sometimes a cultural issue. Typically, having in the US, UK more allegations when you see in some Eastern European countries. Is one hand, but you might have certain entities, local directors, which. Um, you know, there might be an issue, yeah, because you have many, sometimes it's just one whistleblower. So I think it's worth and to look into, sorry. <laughs> hey, I locked up my cat. <laughs> no, it's, not my, it's not my dog. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter wished to have one. No, it's not our, no, but um, this is on one point. And the last point, um, again, just once we're implementing it, and I can imagine it's the heart of a small the company is, um, yes. really get confidentiality, must be a need to know basis sharing information is the key uh, to protect both yes. the whistleblower and the accused. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's the best, but of course, hard to take out line management from any allegation investigation. Yeah. This is extremely difficult. Keep the mm -hmm. thing secret, keep the thing clearly contained within audits and compliance. Yeah. Just a file. But this is the biggest challenge, by the way, anyway, I've, I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and maybe just picking up on your last point, I, I think even for a small company, I talked about the cost and management going on. seriously. Um, I would still say you need a provider um, to be sure um, that you can fulfill the confidentiality at, at the incoming end. You, you have the highest uh, ability to keep things confidential if you do it through a provider. 
uh, everything else that happens then internally is, is obviously up to you, but it cannot be repeated often enough that the confidentiality is, is also in the directive, a top point. And remember linked also to the documentation requirement, you have to document everything. And the provider here can tell, help you with the intake. And then you're responsible for the documentation that has to be established as to each report and here too. I mean, we're talking locked cabinets, passwords, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's how important it is. I can't emphasize enough that the damage that can be done to employees who are sometimes not even maliciously, but who are sucked into an allegation yeah. um, when, yeah. and, and some companies trying to do the right thing, rush that first phase. Um, yes. and, and it has some, some very serious consequences for individuals. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, another question from the audience around the statistics uh, you quoted. Um, mm -hmm. Could you share details of the resources that you, you, that you use for, for those stats, please? Yes. Um, a while ago, I asked friends and compliance departments, and <laughs> this is actually the numbers I gave you. No, no, not what I put on the slide, but the numbers I gave you is, um, is pretty much in line with what my friends reported, uh, what kind of, of levels of reporting activity they might have. Um, the numbers you see on the slide are actually from Googling uh, reports, annual reports that are being put out amongst uh, them by, by providers of hotlines. And I just didn't wanna put down all the names because I didn't think that was fair, but I'm thankful, thankful to the providers for the simple reason that um, the know-how, the experience, the collective experience they share with us yeah, is, is just incredibly valuable. You cannot in your own company establish these kinds of KPIs on your own. And I'm happy to share those uh, sites if anybody needs them. Well, I have to say, uh, as someone who works in that space as a provider, <laughs> I, I, I hope I hope no company and none of you certainly are ever exposed to the number, the sheer volume of whistleblowing investigations that we get dragged in into. By definition, people come to us when things have, have gone wrong. Um, right. And hopefully you won't have to test that in, in live situations um, yeah. often. But then, yeah. Again, you want reports. <laughs> Remember. <laughs> um, this is, this is a, I mean, whistleblowing is a, is a topic that holds a particular interest to me. Um, uh, Antia, thank you so much for a, an informative and lively sessions. Please, again, as mentioned at the start of, of this conference, these online events are, are limited in, in the way we can interact, but they do give you an opportunity to contact uh, the speakers, the panelists, the moderators directly, and it does give us an opportunity to answer questions post-event. So if you have questions, if you... Uh, on this topic, you know, you have a fantastic expert in Antio who, who continues to be available. Please don't hesitate to reach out to the organizers or to her directly. And Antio, thank you so much for bringing today to a, what I think is a very successful, very well attended close. You're most welcome.